eventually we'll say, uh-oh, we better change that, right? And we can change it, but that'll take some time. It has to do with the residence time of the reactor and so on and so forth. But an alternative strategy is do this. Measure the cooling water itself. Measure the temperature of the cooling water and try to control that. That's what this thing does. Measure cooling water temperature and attempt to control that by manipulating this wood makeup. So this little controller just tries to keep cooling water temperature constant. And this outer controller just determines what this set point should be for that cooling jacket, you see. What's the advantage of this? Well, if this temperature were to change, you'll see it very quickly in the jacket, right? The, the, jack, the thermal capacitance of the jacket is small compared to the reactor, right? So the dynamics of the jacket are fast compared to the reactor, so you'll see changes in the, in the cooling jacket much more quickly than the reactor. So the, if this, co this controller will work to keep the temperature the same, Okay, and then this controller will change the, the t um, temperature of the target temperature set point for this. So if this changes, you'll see it much more quickly there and you can compensate for it right away or very quickly. Okay, you'll get, mu it'll be like this. So if you looked at the temperature coming out of the reactor, this would be if you didn't control the jacket temperature, if you did, it would look something more like that. So it's going to reduce variability. Okay, and again, this, so this is, this one over here, was what? This was a um, level to flow cascade. This one is a temperature, right? Temperature to flow cascade. And this one essentially is another temperature to flow cascade because I consider pressure of a gas just to be the flow of the gas. But, okay? So they're always, <laughs> they're always valves and flows. Okay. So you guys are too young to remember the first Gulf War. But, so, okay. There, uh, I have a, there's a reason I'm mentioning this. Um, because at one point, Saddam Hussein, you remember this guy? Maybe not, but he said, okay, this is going to be the mother of all wars. I don't know if you ever remember the famous statement um, that he made about the, this is the... This is the mother of all block diagrams here, all right? So it's the, it's, it's the most um, unwieldy, um, large-looking thing we've currently encountered. Uh, may not be the mother of all block diagrams we ever see, but it is the current mother. Okay, so, so this is just a picture, so this is a generic picture in a block diagram form of a cascade control system, okay? So let's march through this so we can understand what we're doing here. So we have our typical output here. We're, because we have two measurements and two controllers, we're, we're differentiating everything by subscripts one and two, okay? Subscript 1 means things have to do with the main control loop, and subscript 2 means things have to do with this inner loop, so we can keep them straight. So there's the main output we want to control. We've got to measure it, right? We've got to compare that to a set point in the same units, generate an error signal, and this controller operates on that error signal, and it generates a set point for this inner loop, right? That's what cascade control is. So in the inner loop, we measure this output and the selection of this output is critical for this inner loop to be effective. I've given you some examples, we'll talk more about it. Measure that, compare it to the set point provided by this outer loop, generate an error signal, goes through this inner controller, generates a signal that's sent to the valve, okay? And there might be an inner process, but for the examples I've given you, the inner process is the valve. But you know, it could also be another, we'll see an example of this, but just for the sake of generality, it might be an inner process in addition to the valve. The flow, if it's a flow control cascade, the inner, this is all just a valve here, but otherwise maybe not. All right, then we might have two <laughs> types of disturbances here. One that enters the outer loop and one that enters the inner loop. And this whole idea of cascade control is useful for disturbances that enter the inner loop directly. Okay? So I'm going to do something you hate, and that's this. Okay? So that's why this strategy works, right? Because this disturbance enters this inner loop. It enters this circuit for cooling water, right? If we look at over here, this disturbance here in the upstream pressure enters this inner loop. So these are things that affect the inner loop faster than the outer loop, and that's why it works well. So cascade control is um, going to be useful just for this disturbance. It's not going to be useful for any that disturbance because it doesn't enter the inner loop, and it's not useful for the set point just for that disturbance, okay? So you understand to do this, you have to number one, determine there's a disturbance that's really causing you a problem, like the upstream pressure of a valve or something, that it makes sense to do this. And once you determine that, then you have to, yet it's critical you pick a right measurement that reflects that disturbance quickly, all right? 
All right, so this is a quiz of sorts. Let's see if you can pass. What do you think we're gonna do? Hey, another message from my son. Let's see what he needs now. Um, he needs stamps and envelopes. All right. <laughs> we found his calculator last night, so um, good news there. All right. Well, the good news is we found his calculator. The bad news is when he scrutinized its functionality, he said it was inadequate. Um, <laughs> so now I have to get him a new one. All right. I assume you guys were um, very similar when you were. You're actually still the same age, basically. Um, he's 17, so you guys are what, like 21, 22? Is that right? Yeah. So I mean, 19. You're, you're, you must have got out of school early. <laughs> All right. Um, okay. So, but back to the quiz. Sorry. Let's leave my son out of this. What do you think we're gonna do with this block diagram? Who wants to make a guess? Add another loop. No. No, not yet. What do we like to do with every, so this is a picture, now we need an equation, right? So we're going to generate a, it's, yeah, right, a closed loop transfer function for this. Now this looks pretty unwieldy, right? Um, and, and for the reasons I just explained to you, the transfer function we're interested in is the transfer function between this disturbance and, and sorry, the output, right? Because I'm telling you, cascade control, not useful for that, not useful for that, useful for this. So I really want the closed loop transfer function that relates that disturbance to the output here. Okay. So, um, you remember this magical formula? Okay. We've used it. It's really, this is the best example of how to use it, I think, and the power of it. So this is just <laughs> makes it look unnecessarily confusing, but you remember the idea. If you want to know the closed loop transfer function between some input and some output, you know, zi and z, then in the numerator, you put all the transfer functions that are in the path between those two, okay? And then you have one plus pi e, where pi e is everything in the feedback loop, right? So we've used this formula before. So what we're gonna, how we're gonna apply this formula to the picture here is we're gonna first apply it to the inner loop. We're gonna basically use this to eliminate the inner loop. And then once we do that, then we're gonna apply it a second time to the outer loop. So this is an example, if you tried to do this by hand, by just writing out all the algebraic relations and combining them, it would probably be a pretty unpleasant experience for you. So this is much more efficient. So unfortunately, I don't have the, I have to keep going back and forth to the picture because I couldn't fit the picture on here because um, I'm not clever enough. If I should have animated and then stuck the picture there. But anyway, um, all right, so what do we want to do? Sorry that I have to keep flipping back, but without the picture, it's kind of hard and I'm not trying to draw this on the board. All right. So we're going we're gonna to try to work with this inner loop. So I'm going to be interested here in two transfer functions, right? If we look at this inner loop, that's the output of the inner loop, y2. The inner loop has two inputs, that disturbance and this set point, right? So I'm going to apply this formula to get those two transfer functions, and then but when I get those, I'll finally get the one I'm actually interested in. Okay. So the set point between that inner um, output y2 and its set point and then that output and the, and the inner disturbance d2. Okay. So first of all, not surprisingly, and I'm going to call this one g1, I'm going to call this g2 for convenience. Not surprisingly, they have the same denominator because you know denominator is always the same for the same feedback loop. It's one plus everything in the feedback loop. Um, you can see there's four transfer functions. Those four transfer functions are that one, that one, that one, and that one. That's the feedback loop, right? So it's one plus all of the things multiplied together in the feedback loop, that's this four. That one, that one, that one, and that one. So that's the denominator, okay? Um, now, you're interested in the one involving D2, then you need to know what's the path between D2 and Y2. Well, that's not too hard, it's just that thing GD2. Okay, that's where, that's where this whole thing comes from, okay? Now, what about the set point? Well, if you look at the set point, it goes through these three transfer functions, right? The feed forward path between that and that, it goes through that, that, and that. So those are the three things in the numerator right there. Okay, so you can look at it more carefully by having the slides maybe next to each other be a little more effective. All right, so that's cool, right? So now you've reduced the inner loop and now I do have to draw a picture because you can't see this and I have to draw this on the board and this is always an exercise in um, I don't know. Futility? Let's see how I can do. To do this, I'm afraid I have to torment you again 
by doing um, this because I can't remember this otherwise. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to redraw this block diagram with those definitions I've just derived for G1 and G2 that eliminate this inner loop and show you how you make do the next step. So let me start way over here. So this is YSP, was it 1? There it is, hold on. Right, it goes through a block called KM1, I hope. That generates something called YSP1 tilde. I know this isn't that exciting. That's life. Plus and minus, we'll have something coming in here. This generates an error, which I assume I called E1. E2, sorry. Right. Wait a minute. Yeah, okay. Thank you. There's controller GC1. That generates the set point called YSP2 tilde. Okay. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to use these relationships that I just derived right there. Okay. So let me make sure I do this correctly. Y2, okay. So this thing goes through, I called this thing, you'll see in a second, G1. You can see this is perilous for me. Okay, this is, I called this thing G2, I think. You see what I've done? I've, I've eliminated that inner loop. And what this says is the transfer function between Y2 and D2 is this G2, and the transfer function between Y2 and the set point here is G1. Okay? So this, the inner loop is now represented with this here. Okay? And so now I have to draw the rest. I'm not that motivated, but I have no choice. Um, so Y2, I already have the dis disturbance coming in. That's good. So this must go through GP1, I guess, now. And then I've got this guy. What was this thing called? GD1? And that's called D1. And that come add these two together. And then you get Y1, right? And then over here, this must be GM1. Oh, I've done it. It's one of my greatest achievements. <laughs> Although it still looks like crap, but whatever. Um, okay, so right, so this, this stuff here, right, that's that whole inner loop. I've, I've now represented it like that and got rid of it. Okay? So now you look at this picture and you're like, oh, now there's a single feedback loop. So now I'm going to apply the formula again to try to find the, I want to find the, oops, transfer function between this guy here and this guy here, okay? And I'm going to just use the same formula again. So I think I can write it up here. I don't know if you can see over here, but so I'm interested in this Y1, D2. So what is it going to be? Well, first of all, you have to find all the transfer functions in the, in the path between D2 and Y1, unless I screwed up. That will be G2 times GP1. And then you have 1 plus everything in the feedback loop. The feedback loop is, are these transfer functions. The controller, the G1 I defined, the GP1 process, the GM1. Okay? Is that, God willing, that's what I have written over there. G2, GP1, 1 plus... They're in different order, but they're the same. All right. Okay, so this is not the form we actually wanted in. So now I would, I'm not going to, I would plug in the G2 that I defined there and the G1 that I have <laughs> defined there. Simplify. And when you simplify, you'll eventually come up with this monster. Okay? Kind of unwieldy looking thing. All right. So there you have it. There's the closed loop transfer function between the inner disturbance and the output Y1. All right, now that we've got this thing, we want to um, use it 
for some reason. So if you look at this, let me see where I'm going here. Um, okay, I'm an anticip. I, th I think people because I've been switching back and forth so much. I'm guessing people are writing this. I'm just trying to stall basically, um, but I'm pretending to do something useful. Let's see if I can pull it off. All right. So, so if someone asks you what's what's what determines the stability of this system, okay? What determines the stability of this closed loop system? The answer should be it's the characteristic equation for the system. And if someone asks, what's the characteristic equation of the system, you'd say it's this denominator of this closed loop transfer function. So if I wanted to find if this system was stable, I would need to analyze this equation. In other words, this thing equals zero and try to find the roots, right? So you can see this is going to be complex because it de depends on both of these controllers, right? You remember the problem we used to have, right? I'd give you a feedback system. I find the range of controller gains that make the system stable, right? And so you take the character equation for that system, set it equal to zero, you the root or direct substitution, find the range. It's going to be more complex now, right? This just looks more complex. And then you can see, ah, uh, this controller appears here and it also appears there and it's multiplying this one. So you imagine if I said both of these were proportional controllers, the idea of finding the range where each of these, right? I could make this a proportional controller, this a proportional controller, and say find the KC1 and the KC2 that make this Stay, it's going to be complex. It's going to like, be a, more difficult than what we did in the past. Okay? But that's what determines stability. So in other words, these two controllers it, uh, affect stability in a complex way. That's different than the whole idea of feed-forward control, right? When feed-forward control, we said feed-forward control has no effect on stability because it's not in the loop. But you can see from the picture here, you know, all these, these controllers are in the feedback loop. So what are you going to do? All right, can't stall anymore. Sorry. So that all, that's what I've said here, okay? All right, so let's say you, you wanted to eliminate cascade control. You wanted to have what I call conventional control. What does conventional control mean? Just one feedback loop, no inner measurement, no inner controller. My argument is that corresponds to this case. No secondary measurement and the secondary controller just being one. So if you go back to the picture here, sorry. So what I want to do is it eliminate this inner loop. So to inner, eliminate this inner loop, you make this thing equal to zero, right? That'll eliminate the measurement. And then you set this controller equal to one. That'll, you, right, you can't set that to equal to zero because that will eliminate everything. <laughs> set it equal to one. And in that case, this controller just sends its signal directly to the valve. So this whole inner loop is now gone, okay? So that's where I came up with this. And if you do that, then you see stabilities. So th if the GM2 is zero, that eliminates one of these guys. So that eliminates this whole thing. This drops out, right? That drops out. The GC2 becomes one. It becomes simplified to this. OK, so you might ask, why am I doing this? Well, here's my goal. I'm going to show you that if you design this cascade control in a reasonable way, that the cascade controller will have better stability properties than the regular controller. Okay, I'm about to show you this. I need these two equations to do it. Okay. So, do I stop my flow control example? Okay. So let's say you have this case here. And this is the set point for the flow, right? And it's coming from a temperature controller or something like this. Okay. Implicit in this idea of feed um, of cascade control is that this loop is fast, faster than the other loop. So in other words, when the temperature controller says, please establish a certain flow for me, this controller does it quickly. You understand? If the temperature controller says, please establish this flow, and this thing is slower than the dynamics of the temperature you're trying to control in the first place, this isn't going to work. So this thing has to be tuned to be fast. Okay? So that's what this statement says here. If the inner loop has faster dynamics, that means this controller here is tuned to be fast. Okay? A general rule of thumb is that like, the inner controller should be five to ten times faster than the outer controller, like way faster. Okay? Why is this feasible? Because this is, you agree, hopefully the dynamics of this system are simple. It's a valve. Right? This valve typically has very fast dynamics, so you can make this loop move quickly because the inherent dynamics of the valve is, is, is fast. Okay? So I'm about to show you if that's the case, then you can you build these things and the system will have better stability characteristics. Okay. How are we doing on time here? All right. All right. So here's a little example. So I'm just making stuff up as usual. I'm just giving you all these transfer functions. So there's the valve. 
Um, that is the inner process because, right, for this particular example, I've taken this GP2 to B1. So the inner process is just a valve. There's the actual process we're interested in controlling, second order. There's the disturbance transfer function for the outer disturbance. There's the one for the inner disturbance. The measurement devices are just two gains. Okay. It's just to illustrate a point. All right. So this was the transfer function I gave you for the inner loop, right? That's the set point to the inner loop, and this is the output of the inner loop. And this thing I called G1. Okay, it's just that. So now I'm, I'm going I'm to calculate what this thing is, and I'm, for this particular thing, I'm just specifying the gain of this inner controller. It's just a proportional controller, and its gain is 4. Because in other words, to evaluate this thing, I have everything I need except that. And if I, now I'm telling you it's just a gain of 4. Now you can just plug everything in. All right. There's the controller. There's the GV. There's the GP2, blah, blah, blah. Okay. Plug it all in. You can end up getting a first order transfer function that looks like this. You believe me, right? I hope. If you look at this, you can see this is going to be a first. I can look at this at least and say this will be, can be written as a first order transfer function. Why? Because when I multiply by s plus 1, this will have no s up there and this will have s highest order well, here will be s so I can do some manipulations and get it to look like a k over tau s plus 1 and that's the k and that's the tau. Okay. So this is, um, so if you look at, so this is the closed loop transfer function for the inner loop. Okay. You notice the closed loop time constant here is <coughs> 0.2. Okay. Do you understand if you don't do if you don't do cascade, the dynamics of the inner loop are the dynamics of the valve, right? So if you go back to this guy here and you look at this, someone asks you, what's the dynamics of this inner loop if you don't do cascade control? You remember what we did is we set that equal to zero, we set that equal to one. For this example, that's one. So it's just the valve dynamics. The only dynamics of the inner loop would be the valve. The time constant of the valve for this example is one. So what I've done is I've wrapped this flow, then that's not a flow control, I've wrapped this inner controller, now I've reduced that time constant to 0.2. You understand? I've made the inner loop faster by a factor of 5 than it would be if I didn't do this, that cascade control. Okay, without cascade control, well I guess that <laughs> that's the story I tell here. Okay. Um, so now what's the inner loop? You have conventional control. Remember that was the case where we set um, this GM2 equal to 0 and we set this GC2 equal to 1. If you plug that in, you'll see this denominator becomes 1. The numerator just becomes GV. So the inner loop is just the valve. Okay. So if you compare these two transfer functions, the main thing you can include is this is a lot faster than this, right? This is a tau of 0.2. This is a tau of 1. So by putting this inner controller in, I've made this valve more have faster dynamics that's what I'm trying to show there and then if you go through the analysis which I don't show the details of so this is that unwieldy closed loop transfer function for um, the outer loop I mean sorry for cascade control and so I plugged all these things in here right I have all these transfer functions now except I don't have the transfer function for the outer controller what I'm trying to do with this example is figure out what range of controller gains for that outer controller will make the system stable. So I'm specifying this is KC1. <coughs> I plug in all this stuff. I specify this is KC1 uh, equal to KC1. I, you'll end up generating characteristic polynomial. It looks like that. I don't go through the steps. Just plug in everything, simplify. You'll get this. And now you know what to do from here, right? You could do direct substitution or Ruth method or whatever. You could find. Um, the largest gain, you could find the range of gains that make it stable, you'd find the largest gain you can use um, is this 43.3. In other words, any gain larger than that system is unstable. Okay? If you do the same thing for conventional control, which means you set the GC2 equal to 1, you set the GM2, where did that guy go? Oh, you set the GM2 equal to 0, that eliminates this term, you set the GC2 equal to 1, that's the same thing I wrote on the previous page. Plug in all the stuff, assuming this is just a proportional controller, KC1, you get this characteristic polynomial. You find the ultimate gain, you find it's 11. Okay? So what's the point? <laughs> the point is, it's better to have a controller gain that's 40, ultimate gain that's 43 than 11. Because you remember the tuning rules? You usually take the controller gain to be some fraction of this. Right? So this says you can use a higher gain, because let's say, I forget what the... Um, 
the Ziegler Nichols kind of tunings are, but maybe they're 0.6 or one half. So here you could use a controller gain around 20, here you'd have to use one around five. Okay? If you can use a larger gain, that means this system will be faster. Okay? So by doing this cascade control, you've kind of increased um, the speed. Okay, that's what this is, this is saying. Okay. All right. So with this kind of analysis in mind, here, here is the kind of design procedure. Well, it's not really a design procedure. So let's say you have a cascade controller like this. So this might be a flow controller. This might be a temperature controller. You have to tune two controllers now. Right? You have to tune this inner controller and you have to tune this outer controller. And the idea here is that you always want to tune the inner controller first and the outer controller second because from the standpoint of this controller here, the plant is this whole thing over here. It depends on this controller. You change this controller, that changes from the perspective of this controller, the plant, right? So it has to be done in this sequential order. It's critical this thing is well tuned, this inner controller. If this controller is not well tuned, this whole thing will break down. So it's got to be tuned to be fast and stable and so on and so forth, okay? So you can imagine that if you have a, if that inner loop's a flow controller and you've, so this is the flow, let's say, versus time, and you've tuned, and let's say you're tuning it t for a set point change, this inner controller. And if you get, if this controller behaves like this, like it's, that means it's way over tuned, it's tuned too tightly, it oscillates, that's going to be a problem. Or if it's tuned to be way too slow, you know, like it just takes forever to get up there. Both these are going to make this <coughs> scheme ineffectual. Okay, so you have to tune that thing well. And, um, I know a guy that did a big control project involving cascade control that I won't explain what it was or who he is. <laughs> and uh, so he spent months at the plant working on this big control project and then ultimately he figured out these cascade controllers weren't well tuned and he had to go retune them and start all over. That doesn't make you very popular. He's the National Academy of Engineering now so I think it all worked out for him. But, um, so it's critical these, this inner controller is, is tuned correctly. So that's just basically saying so typically the interloop could be a proportional controller. You see, you don't need integral action in this controller. You just need integral action in this controller. So it could be proportional, but typically be more like PI. Um, the way you tune this controller is you turn this controller off, okay? And then you take control of the set point yourself and you move the set point up and down, just like I said over there, and tune this controller to get a good response. Obviously you have a model of the process here. You could use IMC and all these kind of things to design the controller. Once this controller is um, tuned, then you turn this controller on, okay? And then you tune it, okay? For set point, and I'll show you a particular strategy to design in a minute, okay? If you decide that you want to retune this controller for whatever reason, you, you have to retune this one as well. So this, this one is independent of this one, but not the other way around, okay? So tuning has to be sequential. All right, whoa. Oh. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just saying, do we have time? Well, I guess we got to start this because we're a little bit behind. Um, I think what I'm going to do something unconventional here. Um, because this is the kind of thing it's going to take me a little while to explain. We only have like 10 minutes. And so what I'll do is I'll end up having to come back to it and explain. So what I'm going to, what I'm going to show you is the results and then I'm going to show you next time how I got them, okay? So what am I doing here? I'm going to show you, I'm going to give you some design equations that provide, like it's a direct synthesis kind of approach. You remember that? You specify what you want the response to be and design the controller. So I'm going to come back to this and what I'm going to do is I'm going to tell you what I want the dynamics of this loop to be. We'll call that GD2, you know, what we'd like the desired dynamics of this loop to be. Design this controller to do it. And then once you've done that, I will specify what I want the dynamics of this outer loop controller, this outer loop to be, and then you'll design this controller to get it. It's just like doing direct synthesis squared, okay? Um, however, you can get a feeling for the, for the um, equations I have up here. This might take me a little time to explain. So at this point, what I'm going to tell you is I went through this procedure. I designed the inner and outer controller, 
and they both ended up being um, PI controllers. Let's see which one is which. They'll, okay, this is the inner controller. It ends up being a PI controller um, with a gain of one and an integral time of one. You'll see this next time when I go through it. And then I designed um, the outer controller. And using the same kind of thing, in this case I used IMC kind of tuning, and it ended up being a PID controller, it looks like. And there's the P, and there's the I, and there's the D. Okay. And since we only have like a little over five minutes, I'm just going to show you how, you how you can do this in, in um, Simulink. And then I'll come back next time and show you how I did the design. Okay, to do this in Simulink, you've got to build something that looks like this. Not surprisingly, you have to build a block diagram of a cascade control system. So how do you do this? Well, you know, these are all these elements you've seen, right? These things are just transfer functions. Then you have some add blocks or add and subtract. You have some step functions for set points and disturbances. You write stuff to the workspace, so nothing's very new here. So this is a realization in Simulink of the example I'll show you next time. So what do I have here? Well, I have two control loops. In this inner loop, I have the dynamics of the valve. I have a disturbance entering this inner loop, and that's what I'm trying to compensate for. Um, I measure the output of this process here, compare it to the set point generated by this controller, operate on that by the controller I designed. It's a PI controller, actually. Okay. Um, send that signal to the valve, and then I have the outer loop. There's the outer process. Did it just get cold in here? I'm, I'm not well. Okay, that's fine. Um, uh, so there's the outer process. I have a disturbance in there. Is that. We measure that output, feed it back. Compare it to the set point, this controller operates on that and then changes the set point for this inner loop. So this is just cascade control, okay? Where did I get that and that? I gave it to you in the problem statement. That's the inner process dynamics, outer process, that's the inner process, like that's the valve. Um, how did I get um, the parameters for these controllers? I designed it. I'll show you how to do that next time. Everything else is just putting, connecting stuff together, okay? All right. So the idea here is to show you how it works. So what I've done is, I guess I did, if I'm smart, I would have done three different tests. One is change this disturbance, another is change that disturbance, and the third would be change the set point. Okay? And what I would want to do is compare how this cascade control compares to just conventional control. You remember conventional control is no no feedback here and this controller doesn't exist, it's just a one. So to do this, even though not shown here, I probably built another MDL file just by you know, eliminating this connection and eliminating that block just to simulate what you get with conventional control. Okay? All right, so what's the moral of the story here? Well, so this is a step change in this inner, so I simulated a step change in this inner disturbance here, both with this cascade control, which is shown here, and then without it, which I tried to explain. And you can see the difference here is ginormous. That comes from Elf, if you happen to see that movie. All right, um, at least that's where I got it from. All right, so the set point's constant, right, at zero, because we're not doing a set point change. We're just trying to reject this disturbance. If you have conventional control, you know, you get this kind of large perturbation, moves away from the set point, takes a while to get it back. If you have the cascade control, it's, it's practically non-existent, okay? So this is the whole point, remember? I promised you that this would do well for that disturbance. And I think, I mean, this is orders of magnitude better, right? So this is a very good design procedure idea if that disturbance changes. If either that disturbance changes or that set point changes, then they're essentially equivalent to each other.